In this tutorial, I'll be showing you an effective and non-destructive workflow for retouching your fashion, beauty, and portrait photos. Hey there, Michael Bolshinovich here from Vibrant Shot. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Vibrant Shot and also on Instagram at uh, Vibrant Shot Photo. So today we're going to be looking at um, kind of an all-encompassing video. We're not going to go into depth on you know particular topics because I've got a lot of courses and topics on things like dodging and burning and uh, you know color corrections and whatnot. But what I wanted to do was kind of look from start to finish um, how do we assemble uh, a fashion photo or a portrait or a beauty photo um, because the workflow is really the same regardless of you know whether it's fashion, beauty, or portrait. It's just kind of uh, how much of, of each thing do we do within those. But generally speaking, my workflow is always the same. So we're going to be looking at a non-destructive workflow um, that you can use to uh, create photos that look realistic, um, which is kind of the number one thing. Make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, they still look like human beings uh, after it. Uh, there's no real shortcuts along the way here. So if you're looking for like, a, you know, super quick workflow that will allow you to retouch and photo in five minutes, um, you're not going to get that here. Uh, we're going to look at more of, you know, what workflow would a professional retoucher take when they're working on um, a fashion portrait or beauty image. So we're going to start off, uh, obviously, at the raw phase uh, and then kind of work through. So basically, we're going to look uh, this is sort of the final product here. Just zoom into that. Um, so this is kind of what we're after. And then I'll, I'll show you where we're starting off with as far as um, the raw file. So if we go into Capture One here, I always use Capture One for retouching, uh, well, for, I guess, processing my raw files. Uh, in some cases, I'll just retouch the image only in Capture One because, again, there's I have a video on how to dodge and burn in Capture One. Um, that's been made better in Capture One 9 because um, their feedback in their layers, uh, their local adjustments, is a lot better now. So if you have a dodge and burn layer here and you start masking in, uh, the response rate is much faster. So it's actually a lot easier uh, with the new version, which is Capture One 9. Um, and so depending on what kind of image I'm after, if it's a portrait, like a black and white or whatever, I might just give it a quick dodge and burn inside of capture one. And, uh, then I'm pretty much done with it. I don't even have to go into Photoshop. Now, in the case of something like this, this is more kind of, you know, on the beauty fashion side. So I did want to go a little bit more, um, kind of detailed with this image. So obviously I did take it into Photoshop, but my process is usually, um, the same regardless um, of what I'm doing is, so, you know, if I'm doing it entirely in here or I'm going to Photoshop, I always kind of do the same thing with the raw file. And um, I do have a detailed video on preparing your raw files in Capture One. So be sure to check that out because that sort of details the process. Um, but at a high level, basically the number one thing is, you know, get your white balance the way you want it to because um, white balance is very important for uh, sort of how the final image is going to turn out. It's not something you can really fix in Photoshop. So uh, when you're uh, starting out, make sure the first thing you do is just white balance because it changes, um, you know, kind of the balance of um, colors within uh, each area of the histogram. And so your exposure will vary and things like that. So uh, start there. This one here was shot around sunset. So you can see it's got this kind of golden light. That's sort of the the white balance out of camera. If we wanted to kind of neutralize that, um, we could kind of pick around, try and find a neutral gray here, something like that. Um, so I'm clicking, you know, where the shadow is over here. And that you can see is sort of more neutral white light as if it was daylight. So um, we're not going to be using that because I want to keep this sort of warmer feel within my image. So uh, I was happy with the white balance sort of, you know, the way it was essentially right at the camera. Next thing I do is generally make sure that the exposure is okay. So I go into my exposure tab in Capture One. And again, if you're not familiar with this stuff, uh, check out my other videos on Capture One. I've got a ton of them. And so if we, uh, actually, you know what, let's do this. Let's clone this uh, particular image here to do, do, do clone variant. And then I'm just going to reset all of the adjustments so you can see where uh, we started off with. So uh, there was actually the original. So as you can see, I did make some adjustments to the white balance because this kind of green uh, tinge is not really working for me. So if we go back in here, we can see that we have uh, 5,000 and then around zero uh, on the tint. Here I ended up with 4,807. Now that was not something that I pulled um, using a you know a gray card or anything like that. It's sort of by by taste. So I went into here and I mean, immediately we can see that it's like really green, right? So uh, we're going to take our tint up to kind of neutralize some of that green. So essentially I just kind of kept going on this until it felt about right. 
and then I felt that you know maybe it's a little too warm so I basically just knocked it down uh, somewhere to here so that's kind of what I usually do with my white balance I mean if I'm completely off and there's a neutral gray or something that I can pick off of then I'll use that otherwise um, just kind of go by eye and see you know is it too warm too cool is it too, too much magenta too much green um, and then you know too much magenta too much green use your tint and then too cool or too warm just kind of play with your kelvin but you know generally it takes a couple of rounds of back and forth to find um, that perfect sort of white balance so the next thing i did was i did a little bit of cropping here you can see that um you know the rotation i kind of felt that it's maybe tilted to one side a little bit so i rotated it um so all that kind of stuff and then as far as the actual exposure goes um i did reduce the exposure a tiny bit if you go back to the original we can see that we're heavily pushed towards um the highlights here so i wanted just to kind of nudge it back and that's why um i knocked the exposure down and then the other thing i did was i kind of globally recovered some of the highlights here so again just trying to you know pull the most that we can out of our raw file and uh finally i just added some contrast i'm not going to go into the details of how we do that because again i have a video on adding contrast and it's it's all in my capture one video so check that out uh, so basically that was you know kind of step two so number one is just color get the white balance right step two look at your exposure and what can we do globally in the image to you know get the exposure looking good we want to just kind of a nice distribution of things within the histogram obviously in this one we are pushed heavily on the the shadows here and on the highlights we're sort of on the edges of having information i mean if we look somewhere over here um it's you know it's it's pretty well um blown out it's you know it's almost white but that i was actually okay with that i could have taken this down a bit more but i i kind of like the fact that we have this um bit of highlight here wasn't bothering me if it was then we could again apply a local adjustment here and take that down even further the next thing i do is um you know things like lens corrections so if there's um vignetting or whatever fix that um you know cropping again we did a little bit of cropping here so just get the cropping the way we like it and then finally i always do uh, a set of local adjustments so here the local adjustments were pretty subtle um, basically if we toggle this on and off you can see i extended some of the shadows within here in the hair um, not a ton but just a little bit and if we actually hit the m key you can see where that mask was just kind of around the edges here just wanted to pull a little bit more detail so there's just subtle details i didn't want to make it you know over exaggerated because it's not important details but just so that we actually see a little bit of texture and detail in there um, for eyes, you can just see I lightly brighten the eyes. Um, again, my goal is not to kind of get the end product on the eyes, get them you know super bright and popping, because I'm going to do that inside of Photoshop with a more detailed mask. Um, this was just to, again pull a little bit more um, you know information out of the eyes from the raw file where we have the best information. Uh, uniformity is basically skin tone uniformity, and that's kind of the number one reason why I use Capture One because it allows you to really save yourself a lot of time once you get into photoshop because this uniformity tool essentially if we hit mask i just kind of did a rough mask on the subject i excluded the background the reason i did that for this image is because uniformity kind of grabs a certain color range so you know if we sample our skin tone and let me take you into uh, that tool which is right here in the color editor so if we go into skin tone you can see that it's grabbing this sort of range of color so we basically you know hit this sample key we pick a um, a skin tone and that's what it's going to sort of reference off of so that's our reference skin color that we want and then when we start dragging uniformity up here um, that will try and blend the skin tone throughout the subject um, or whatever is masked in uh, to you know kind of match that that sourced point so basically you know in, in typical image all i really do is exclude the lips and again i have a video on using uniformity so i'm not going to go into too much detail um, but in this case, because I have so much yellow in the background because of the warmer light, um, obviously we're grabbing yellow because skin is predominantly yellow. I didn't want it to change um, the color of the background here. So I just kind of did a rough mask um, to really focus on the subject only. And basically that's, you know, it's a really subtle thing. And in this particular case, you can see, um, you know, we we're kind of go from this uh, more greenish tone to a more pleasing magenta tone and um, the tones in the skin just match a lot better and we can kind of you know crank this up however much we feel is needed um, usually I take it around the halfway point or so and then obviously depending on your image in, in this case we didn't have too much mismatch as far as uh, skin tones go across the subject in some it's more noticeable and that's where this becomes really effective um, so pretty much every image I do use uh, the uniformity tool. It just saves me that much time uh, once I get into Photoshop. So a uh, quick mask and then, you know, using uniformity takes about two minutes, probably saves me, you know, at least 15, 20 minutes in color adjustments afterwards in Photoshop. 
Uh, on the side here, if we hit mask, I've got just, uh, I basically just did a gradient on this side and I just pulled in some highlights. So again, there was, you know, a little bit too much highlight there. If you just take it off, you can see it's pretty bright. And then if I turn that back on, it's just kind of taking down some of these highlight values. So again, very subtle, but you know, little things add up to make a big difference. So now that I'm done with that, um, I'm pretty much, you know, happy with my raw file. I go in, uh, in this case, I've got some recipes, but I'm going to process it at, um, you know, 16 bits. And then I'm going to take it into Photoshop. So jumping into Photoshop here. So this is our final image. Now, what you're seeing here is essentially a smart object of the final image. And I'll tell you why we have a smart object at the end uh, of the tutorial. So let's just jump into the actual image itself. And this is basically what it looks like. And so I'm going to tell you kind of about the workflow that I have um, for my typical image. And, and this workflow doesn't really change. Um, all of my layers are pretty much the same uh, with some very minor nuances throughout. For example, if I'm using, you know, if I'm doing a black and white, then I may not have a ton of color grading. Um, but the general process to get to that endpoint, pretty much the same every single time. So if we start off with our background layer, so let's just toggle everything off. So this is essentially, you know, what it looked like when our raw file came in out of capture one into Photoshop. So our, you know, our end goal is to have it look like this. So basically my process starts off with uh, the healing brush. So generally I'll have another layer over top here called heal. The reason you're not seeing that layer here is um, because these files get massive, like around, you know, a gigabyte, 1.2 gigabytes, once I'm, you know, happy with my image and I know that I'm not going back to this isn't for a client or whatever, um, I just kind of merge the uh, the healed layer with the background layer at the end um, because, you know, ultimately I'm not going to want to bring a pimple back or something like that. So um, that's why I just, in this case, I merged it down into the background because, um, you know, there's no need to take up more space than you need to. So it's up to you whether you leave that. Um, if it was for, uh, you know, a client job or you're retouching for somebody, probably best to leave that in there in case, you know, you need to bring something back. Uh, one... A uh, case where I would leave things in is if you're uh, cleaning up, you know, hairlines or something like that around the outside when you're masking and all that kind of stuff. You never know when you may want to bring something back or if an edge doesn't look uh, quite right. So just kind of leave those ones. But um, in the case of healing, that's usually for thing for me, it's usually things like, you know, um, scars or, you know, pimples or acne, whatever it might be. So generally, you know, that stuff's not ever coming back. So I'll do my healing, obviously healing brush, just kind of go through and remove anything that um, you think needs to be healed. In this case, um, her skin is really, really nice. So there's not that much that needs to be done. Um, and then the next thing I do is look at potentially separating the background and foreground. So you can see I've done that here. I've essentially just cut the subject out. I usually do that just using the quick select, do a selection around the outside, then use the refine edge to clean that up. Um, worst case, I may use the pen tool, uh, if there's, you know, a particular edge that, uh, that won't select easily if I'm outside or, you know, it's an outdoor shoot, uh, then sometimes you need to use the pen tool for it. Again, sometimes you may not need to make that separation. If, um, you're not really doing anything in the background, then it may not be worth taking the time to do it. In this case, I have done it. And, um, for the background, really, I've just kind of, um, darkened down this side. So I decided I wanted to take this side and, and reduce the exposure on it a little bit and then maybe for this side if we wanted to make it even I could have brightened it back up a bit um, it's really entirely your call or maybe I wanted to color grade the background differently or something like that so and it was a really easy extraction here so I figured why not spend five minutes and do it so once I've got those separated um, then my subject uh, usually has um, the dodge and burn inside of it so if we turn that on this is what the dodge and burn does and you can see this is my um, dodge and burn set over here so this is basically the same uh, techniques that I teach in my retouching academy dodge and burn course so um, I'll put a link to that here if, uh, somewhere down below if you want to check it out and basically I've got um, a couple of sets of layers here I've got um, they're just basically groups with um, layer curves over here so they're adjustment layers that are curves brighter and darker and then I just mask in all of my stuff so those are that's kind of the dodge mask um, that's the burn mask and then uh, I don't know if I did anything with these ones. No, these ones are just kind of there because they're part of my action. Um, basically, I have a normal and a strong one. Usually the strong one is more if I need to do a really aggressive dodge on something, if I'm working on a particular detail like lips or whatever it might be. Um, I keep it separate. And so one good thing to always do is when you're doing your um, dodging and burning, if there's a particular area that you think is like kind of going to require some color adjustments or whatever, maybe you're working on hands, knees, uh, lips, 
uh, the whites of the eye, those are kinds of things that often once you fix the luminosity shifts, you have to do some sort of color adjustments on them. Um, that's a good time to create a separate stack for dodging and burning. So call it, you know, DNB hand, DNB lips, and do that and then clip a separate hue saturation adjustment to those so you can fix your colors. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on that because I, I do have videos that talk about this stuff. I also have the course on Retouching Academy that you can check out. But basically, um, you know, once I've got everything healed, the next step for me is always dodging and burning. And that's really the only way to get a nice result. Um, doing things like frequency separation or, you know, inverted high pass, whatever. Um, they're helpful, but, you know, ultimately they're destructive and, um, you know, they don't really lead to the most natural results. So uh, generally speaking, I stick to dodge and burn pretty much always. Uh, sometimes if there's things that you need to, you know, kind of fix on a larger scale, I may, you know, grab fragments. So like make a lasso selection, grab a chunk and then free transform it, put it into places. Um, that's sometimes a step that I have in between here and, um, you know, healing and, and dodging and burning. But generally speaking, uh, what I try and do is any time that I'm affecting sort of rasterized pixels. So when you're healing, obviously you're, you're actually drawing in new pixels on this new layer, right? So when I grab my healing brush and I start healing, um, it's creating new pixels on here. Whereas everything else above that is all adjustment layers. So they're, you know, hue saturation adjustments, selective color adjustments, layers, curves, whatever it might be. Um, sorry, not layers, uh, levels. So those are all adjustments though, so that basically you can always roll them back. You can change the degree of them. Um, and then, you know, they're very flexible. Whereas everything down here, I mean, healing, it's not something that you can easily roll back unless you have this layer and you start masking things out. Um, generally speaking, you can't, you know, do too much with it. Once it's there, it's a rasterized pixel and, and that's it. What we never want to do is take this healing and put it up here because um, once we have it, we're kind of committed to it and we can't adjust these adjustment layers below because if I change, um, you know, an exposure or a color down here, uh, my rasterized pixels above will not change to reflect that so they just won't match anymore so that's why anything to do with rasterized pixels put it at the bottom do it at the beginning and get it out of the way um, as annoying as some of those things can be just do them first then once we got that obviously again another reason you want to do that before you do the extraction is sometimes you'll be cleaning up hairs around the outside so if you're healing those out um, you know heal them out clone them out whatever get that finished and then do your refine edge and and everything like that to get your extraction so that's why we got that step. So step one, heal, you know, fix anything around the hair, anything rasterized, and um, then you can move on to adjustment layers. So another thing I put in here is this details. That is uh, something I'll come back to and I'll tell you why that's down here as well. So once we've gotten through the dodging and burning, the, the two corrective ones, and again, corrective is really just, you know, fixing sort of minor um, issues with, you know, um, transitions in terms of luminosity so if there's patches on the face the skin whatever that's what we're really doing with the corrective so let's just um turn on a helper layer here which is basically just turning my photo black and white to help me see where those problems are and let's just turn all this stuff off here so this is where we start off with so you know doing that really we're just kind of fixing any of these you know blotchy areas or you know, slight shifts in uh in luminosity just smoothing everything out and as you can see from my mask i mean it's not terribly complicated right it's really just painting in white um, to fix those particular areas so again uh, more detail on that in my uh, course on retouching academy for this I don't think I like I said I didn't use this because there's nothing that really you know needed aggressive dodging and burning and then the contour really just adds shape and dimension so you can see that I have um, you know enhanced the cheekbones uh, enhanced some of the highlights in the hair um, and then just kind of added a little bit more depth and dimension to the image so that's what contouring is all about Again, talk about this in my retouching course, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail there. Otherwise, this video would be incredibly long. And um, so that's basically it for dodging and burning. And you can see that that is um, sort of the final result before, after. And one reason why I do like to have a mask around uh, the dodging and burning layers is that I can, for example, go into here and, you know, easily add dimension by burning around uh, my subject without worrying about it spilling onto the background because I've got that extraction like somewhere here for example if I wanted to you know burn this uh, outer edge it's very easy to spill on the background whereas you know if I have the the mask around it, it doesn't matter I can just kind of haphazardly start painting here and it's not going to look bad another thing that I will often do and in this case I didn't need to do it um, the uniformity inside of capture one helped me with it is that I need to fix mismatched skin tones so if we turn off that black and white adjustment 
sometimes um, you know the chest or the the hand or arm whatever might not match the tones in the neck or face and so what I'll usually do is um, if I hold down my command key and add a group I'll usually have a group in here called local and I just I call it local for me like sort of local adjustment um, and then in here I'll make you know a series of selections so I may grab the lasso tool and like select you know sort of an area of the neck here something like that and then hit the Q key filter blur Gaussian blur you know let's just add a bit of blur to that hit Q again so we got a selection and then I may you know add um, hue saturation adjustment or a curves adjustment uh, and then you know kind of play with the degree of saturation so maybe we want to you know increase the saturation a tiny bit there which actually doesn't look too bad so that's often what I'll do as well um, it doesn't really matter if you do that before or after the dodging and burning I usually leave it for after sometimes I feel like doing it before if it's really off like if it's you know if it's slightly off then I'll probably leave it for after if you've got a hand that is like completely red and the rest of the body is more of a yellow tone um, then I try and fix that beforehand because it just throws off my sort of perception of the image so uh, you can kind of do it at any point but again I try and do that within my masked layer of the subject because again if I'm working on something uh, let's say I want to take the entire lower half of the body right something like this um, and then I you know feathered it out I want to make sure that I'm just highlighting or uh, capturing the body here I'm not spilling out in the background with my adjustment because the, the problem is with the skin and not necessarily with the background so you know that again will be a series of curves usually hue saturation and sometimes selective color to make those adjustments and um, I do have a video on uh, matching color tones using selective color so check that one out for uh, more information on how to do that and then the final thing that I always apply well actually let's let's step back before I do that we've got this details layer and the reason I have it um, down here is because sometimes in the details I do things like drawing in eyebrows or eyelashes so it's more of kind of like a rasterized layer um, in this case I don't it's all adjustment layers and, and really at this point it doesn't matter if I have it above or below my dodging and burning and you know grading and all that stuff but um, if you are drawing in eyebrows or eyelashes and you know you're matching the color that you're drawing to the brow itself um, if we were to put it up here and we changed our color grading uh, it would actually look off right because we've sort of matched it to uh, the pre-graded value and then um, you know when we start playing with our grading it will start to look off so again you know if you've got rasterized bits here do them down here below um, your subject adjustments all your layer based adjustments um, and so what we basically do with this details and details I'm referring to things like eyes lips you know brows lashes um, the details on the face essentially so here all I really did was I just kind of brightened up um, the eyes uh, I just created sort of a mask around here again I've got a whole thing on retouching eyes so you know you may be whitening the whites of the eyes um, you may be changing the color of a lip um, you know working on teeth whatever uh, so I do all of that here with adjustment layers and that's generally just curves and um, selective color adjustments so again look at my uh, different tutorials and courses for that um, in my RGG EDU course I cover kind of this whole process um, in a lot of detail as well and then finally we're on to the grading uh, again I'm gonna have a course on color grading so it's, it's kind of a big topic it's not something you can really cover in a short period of time um, but basically my color grading process is again more or less the same every time um, this is kind of before and after uh, and you know grading is really an important thing because that's where you can kind of make the colors complementary make things really you know pop um, really work on the contrast levels you know what your highlights look like what your shadows look like and so it's definitely an important thing to learn but it's not a terribly complicated thing once you actually get into it so without going into a lot of details on these layers generally you know I work on a couple things so I work on contrast so how much um, you know how deep do I want the shadows to be um, and you know how strong do I want the highlights to be and part of that goes into this whites and blacks here um, these high this highlight layer is essentially creating a little bit of extra highlight for me um, and that's just using um, a solid fill layer that's kind of masked in um, using white so that's a um, fairly simple process as well and I do cover that in my RGG EDU course and then I've got blacks and whites these are just selective color adjustments so basically I'm just saying you know how deep do I want my blacks to be what color do I want my blacks to have do I want them to be more blue more magenta more cyan more red um, and so just you know going selective color and playing with the black sliders uh, whites is the same thing just on the whites. so you know how do I want my highlights to look 
skin tones is really just working on yellows and reds again with selective color and then I always finish off with saturation so I use hue saturation to kind of um, work on reds and yellows and you know how saturated do we want them to be and so really that's all that is and I mean kind of together that creates this final effect and so as you can see mostly just adjustment layers and usually um, I have an action that I created for myself that creates this whole stack for me and I just go in and I start playing with the sliders uh, another thing that I'll often add is color balance so that's um, this one here as well to finish off if things still don't look quite right you can start playing with you know midtones um, with your color in the midtones shadows and highlights um, it's a nice finishing tool as well that I've uh, really come to use so generally color grading is usually for me selective color uh, sometimes curves but rarely I rarely adjust colors and curves because I don't find you get very good control with it so selective color curves um, sometimes black and white adjustment using different uh, blend modes or blending modes uh, as they say so yeah, technically the correct term is blending modes I don't want to get tripped up on that one um, and uh, so black and white adjustment and then uh, color balance selective color so those are uh, the things that I tend to use for color grading and really nothing else. So once I've got that, um, that's sort of my finished product. Again, we can get rid of this heel because we didn't really use it. That was just for demonstration purposes. So again, kind of before and after, uh, that's what all that stuff does. And as you can see, generally speaking, all non-destructive. Um, the only thing that really was, you know, rasterizing was this layer here because there is some um, white solid paint there essentially. Um, but, you know, you, you can't be... 100% adjustment layers. I mean, you can do this kind of with a curve, but the um, the final effect is not quite as good. But generally speaking, everything is just masks and adjustment layers. So now that we're done with that, what I tend to do is uh, convert that to a smart object. And if I need to apply any sort of liquefying or final camera raw filter um, to that, I'll do that here. And essentially, um, we've got that. If we actually toggle back and forth, you can see what I've done there. I've just like really minor, um, you know, I brought this down. Um, I worked on the hair here. I just kind of pushed it down. And with the camera raw filter, I probably just tweaked the um, the final white balance. I think I made it a tiny bit cooler. So I apply that all to the smart object at the end. And then to export, I have a video on how I export my images. I still do the same exact thing that I ever have, um, depending on the resolution you need. For web, I do 2048px on the long edge for you know for if I'm delivering it to a client well it depends what resolution they need so from there I'll just um, create a new layer stamp it out command option shift E so that will create uh, the final sort of rasterized layer I duplicate that out to a new image essentially so I'll just call it output and then from here I'll resize do any final cropping that I want to depending on what I need to use it for um, then I'll usually use alien skin exposure to add a little bit of grain to it. Um, sometimes I'll add a little bit of contrast in alien skin as well if it looks good. And then just save for web. Um, obviously if I'm exporting for like a print magazine, then that's usually going to be exported as a TIFF file in CMYK using the appropriate color profile. Um, for web, I just always output with uh, save for web. And um, in terms of resizing, again, I've got that video on uh, saving for the web, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. So basically, that is uh, my workflow. As you can see, it's not terribly complicated. It's really just kind of a matter of um, playing with that and uh, finding, you know, the, the set of adjustments that work for you and obviously becoming good at something like dodging and burning because um, really the majority of the effect here is, you know, as you can see, is dodging and burning. It's just adding depth through contouring and just making the skin look perfect uh, using those, um, you know, corrective layers that I have right in here. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, obviously, a lot of information, and sorry I couldn't go into a ton of detail on every one of these because, you know, ultimately this video would be like seven hours long. Uh, so it's just a little too much to try and cram into... Uh, one particular lesson, but I just really wanted to show you here what are the elements that you need to learn um, to you know create a nice photo at the end, um, one that looks natural, and um, to kind of show you that really there's no gimmicks when it comes to retouching. It's really just kind of basic foundation stuff. You know, heal, dodge, and burn, um, adjust colors using adjustment layers, and then grade your image. And obviously start off with a good raw file. Make sure that you're using a good raw converter like Capture One. Um, trust me, the comparison to Capture One and Lightroom is like light years, especially with uh, Capture One 9. Um, the image quality is just that much better, which is why I always use Capture One. 
And so starting off with a really good raw file and then carefully non-destructively retouching it inside of Photoshop from there on uh, using some of the workflows that I showed you here today. And um, if you want any more information on those little bits and pieces, uh, you know, be it Capture One, Dodging and Burning, be sure to check out um, my other YouTube videos, especially for Capture One. And for things like Dodging and Burning, Color Grading, take a look at uh, the two courses you see down here in the banners below. And so I um, hope you enjoyed the video and make sure you subscribe to get future updates and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.